If you have a Bible, you're going to turn into Psalm chapter 51. We're going to read that whole chapter here in just a second. Psalm, Psalms is in the, uh, just kind of in the, right in the middle of your Bible. And um, if this is uh, your first time here, like we said earlier, welcome. If this is your first time maybe in a, in a little while or maybe since uh, you haven't been here since maybe summer started, well, we're, in a, we're in a sermon series called uh, Summer in the Psalms. And so all this summer long, we're going to be in this book looking at different chapters in the Psalms. And, and Chad, our pastor, he, he says it, uh, I think he said it every time that he's preached. We kind of have alternated a little bit uh, preaching back and forth. But he says uh, that we're singing our way through the Psalms. And, and he says that because the book of Psalms were songs that were sung by God's people. They're songs of celebration. Uh, they're songs of, of also of sorrow and lament. They're songs uh, of worship and adoration. They're songs about questions and struggles. Um, they're songs of God's faithfulness and care. And the, the thing about the Psalms is they're songs about life, about real life. When we're going uh, through life's ups and good times, and then when we're going through life's downs, through bad times and, and everything, in between, and this is such an important book, and I'm so glad that we are, we're doing this. And today we're looking at Psalm 51. Now, in Psalm 51, um, my, my Bible has this little introduction, and it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. And so there, there, there's a backstory here to why this psalm was written. And to understand Psalm 51, um, we, you have to go back and read 1 Samuel uh, 11 and 12. And I, you can go back and read that. I, I just kind of want to summarize it for you. But David, who wrote this psalm, King David, King David, who wrote this song, David did something bad, uh, something really, really bad. Some of you, if you've, you've been in church a while or, or if you're familiar with the Bible, you already kind of know this story. But for those of you who, who maybe are new to this, I, I, I want to tell you. So King David was, was walking around the rooftop of his palace. And, and when he looks over and he sees a, a woman bathing. Um, and the Bible makes a point to say that this was, this was a, a beautiful woman. And so what David did is David, he, he did the righteous thing. And immediately he turns around and he goes, goes back down off the rooftop wrong no he didn't do that he didn't do that David uh, David liked what he saw and he had one of his men to go find out who she was and so they came back and reported that she was Uriah's wife Uriah happened to be uh, someone who fought in David's army so David immediately he immediately feels bad uh, because that he was lusting after someone else's wife and he, he goes to God and he says God please forgive me okay you say it wrong yeah no that's not what he did David has her brought to him and 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 they spend the night together and and because of that Bathsheba becomes pregnant with David's baby and so David uh, after this David accepts full responsibility confesses his sin and does the right thing he talks to Uriah and does whatever is in his power to make things right wrong exactly Uriah is actually out fighting he is a warrior and so he is out fighting I think too where David should be as well but he is out fighting in David's army so David has him brought home hoping that as a husband who's been away from his wife for a long time fighting battle would come back home and 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 do what what husbands and wives do when they haven't seen each other in 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 a long time and and then Bathsheba the, the, with Bathsheba being pregnant then that wouldn't be so weird because hey remember Uriah came home for battle for a little bit um and and but Uriah didn't go home he came back, but he stayed at the palace, and he slept alongside the, the other servants of the king. And, and David said, why? David confronted him about it. He goes, why didn't you go home? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said, how can I go home and when I know that my men are out there fighting? I'm not going to go home. So again, David, gosh, he, he feels really bad. He's defeated. He came clean with Uriah. He told him everything that had happened, and he begged for his forgiveness and told him he would do whatever it took to make things right. Wrong. Since Uriah wouldn't go home, David arranged it so Uriah would be sent back to battle. And here's the other thing. He sent him so that he, would, he was sent to the part where the fiercest fighting was going on. And then what they were ordered, when Uriah was there, some of the people that were with him were ordered to withdraw. So then Uriah would be killed. So just to summarize there, David did a really, really 
really bad thing, several bad things. He committed adultery. He committed murder. Uh, and so God, God obviously knows what, what happened, and, and he sends his prophet Nathan um, to, to confront David with his sin. But Nathan doesn't just come right out and say it. He, he's he's kind of tricky the way he does it. He tells David a story. And I actually want to read this for you. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read this to you. But it's in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it says, So the Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he arrived, Nathan said to David, There were two men in a certain city. One was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had a very large flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one small lamb that he had bought himself. And he raised her, and she grew up with him and his children. And from his meager food, she would eat. So this poor man didn't have anything. And the sheep, sheep what food the, the man had, this sheep would eat from that. From his cup, she would drink. And in his arms, she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man's house. Uh, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and he prepared it for his guest. And look at David's response. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb. And Nathan replied to David, you're that man. Bust it. The Bible doesn't say this, but I, I, I can just kind of imagine David when, when he hears that. I mean, it's just like the, the air leaves the room. And, and I can just kind of see him fall into his knees. And his, his righteous indignation all of a sudden went to sorrow, went to this tremendous guilt and shame. And the first words out of David's mouth in 2 Samuel he says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And now we get to Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. Verse 10, God, create in me, cre create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then, then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God. God of my salvation and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want sacrifice or I would give it. You're not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. I don't know if you know this, but uh, um, some of you may have missed a very important event nine days ago. Um, did you know that on June 21st, it was National Selfie Day? Did you guys know that? Yeah, some of you didn't celebrate. I can tell by your reaction. Some of you did not do it. Some of you did. You were kind enough to share a, so, uh, a selfie on social media. Uh, isn't it, it's kind of crazy. This isn't about our culture that we have a national selfie day. As if we're already not so obsessed with ourselves already. It's like, hey, let's make a day where we just take pictures of us. Um, and, and I feel like sometimes it's, sometimes it's like every day is a selfie day. Um, anyway, I, I participated. I participated, but... 
I didn't post it, though, because I wanted to save it for today. And here's the thing. I, I wanted you to see the real me. Okay? No, I, I, I didn't. There, there, were, there were no, I didn't use any filters. I didn't, I didn't try to make it real, real artsy. I didn't do black and white. I, I didn't try to get the, bless, the best lighting. I didn't put my hand on my hip and turn my leg in and do that. You know, I, I didn't do any of that. It's just, it's just the real me. And I want to show you. Here's my picture. Boom. That's my picture. That's me. That's that's the real me. I'm a sinner. And sin uh, is a word that, that you hear at church, but, but basically it, it means choosing to do life your own way instead of God's way. You, you, you say that, you, or you choose not to do what God has asked you to do, or you choose to do the things that God has asked you not to do. It means that, that, that you're going to ignore God's desires for you and, and do whatever, whatever you want to do. So, so sometimes um, you live life like I'm, I'm the only one that matters. And, and I, I do. I live life like I'm the, the only one that matters. And, and, and I'm a sinner. And, and I'll confess one sin to you right now. I'll just be, be open and honest. And I know my family's going, uh, what is he about to say? What is he about to say? Okay. But I, I'll be quite honest with you. One of my biggest struggles in my life is selfishness. It's selfishness. I sometimes live my life like I'm the only one that matters. Um, I do it in my marriage. You just ask my wife, and she probably has tons of examples of, of my selfishness. I, I struggle with selfishness sometimes as a parent. Just ask my kids. They, they can give you examples. I think about me way more than I need to sometimes. And, and, and that's, a, that's a big one in my life. It hurts my marriage when I am selfish. It hurts my, my kids when I'm selfish. And, and it, it, hurts, it hurts my performance at work. It hurts my relationships. Uh, but, but most importantly, my sin, my selfishness, it hurts my relationship with God. Just like David, I can say, I have sinned against the Lord. But I, I want to let you in on a little secret. And, and, and if you're going to take notes, this is the first First little blank there. Here's, here's the deal. Sin is everyone's issue. Sin is everyone's issue. None of us have escaped that. And, and, and I know some of you may be here to church for the first time or, and, or, or for back in a long time. You're like, okay, great. Here goes the preacher. He's going to tell me how bad I am. And he's just going to rag, rag. No, well. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, I, I'm with you. I, I'm a sinner, and none of us have escaped that. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Okay, not a single person. That means, that means me, and that means you. We're, we're all guilty. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, and, and, and the worst part about those verses is that, is that, the whole idea that no one, no one is exempt. No one, no one can escape this issue. Um, you know, the, the Greek word for all used there is, it means all. <laughs> Everyone, we're all guilty. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all can say what David said. I have sinned against the Lord. Now, now some of you may be going, no, whoa, Jimbo, just back that train up just a little bit. I know, I know I'm not perfect. I get that. No one's perfect. No, no one is, but, but let me get a little text in here. But I ain't never done anything close to what David did, man. There's no way. That, that was messed up. And I get it. I get it. Um, uh, l telling a lie seems a little less extreme than maybe uh, uh, murder or, or, or adultery. Or, you know, me uh, kind of completely ignoring my responsibilities at home for about three hours so I can watch the Dallas Cowboys. That doesn't seem nearly as, as big as, as, as some, some other sins. But here's the thing. Uh, remember that whether our sins in our eyes are relatively small or relatively big, they all have the same, listen to this, they all have the same eternal consequences. They all have the same eternal consequences. They separate us from God. And um, I, I don't think it's an overstatement here to say that God hates sin. He hates all sin because sin 
is, is the complete, it's the, it's the very antithesis of who God is. Um, God hates sin for, for the simple reason that it separates us from him. He, sin is bad, and, and, and we're all sinners. And, and, and God does not want for us what sin does to us. You've, you've heard the term that God is a jealous God, and it's not jealousy like what we think about jealousy, like I want what you've got. God is jealous for us because he knows when we choose to do something else other than follow him, he knows what that does to us and what the damage that causes, and so he wants to bring us in relationship with him. But, but like I said before, sin is everyone's issue, and that's not good. But, and I'm so glad that we, we can say but there, The next thing is this. Through God's mercy and grace, sin is a fixable issue. It's a fixable issue. So how how in the world can our sin be forgiven? How in the world can what I've done ever, ever be fixed? And the only way that it happens is because God gave Jesus the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin. You see, God wasn't going to sweep David's sin under the rug. He wasn't going to ignore it. He wasn't going to just look away. He wasn't going to give, uh, you know, David just a kind of pat on the back and say, it's okay, just do better next time. No, he, he wasn't, God doesn't, God doesn't ignore sin. And, and, and he doesn't ignore our sin either. He doesn't look the other way. He, he doesn't just, just, just say, hey, you know, try, try harder next time. No, David's sin, my sin, your sin, the world's sin, it, it, it must be judged, and it must be dealt with. In other words, there has to be a punishment. There is a price to pay for our sin. And here's the thing, it has to be paid in full. There's no, there's no layaway plan for sin. There's no installment plan for sin. It has, it has to be paid. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross. One of the last things Jesus said on the cross was, it is finished. It's finished. What was finished? Well, the punishment for our sins. Jesus took it all. He, all the wrath of God against sin was placed on Jesus. For, the, for our sins, for the sins of the world, past, present, and future, all of it was placed on Christ, on the cross, and he bore it for all of us paid in and he paid it in full finished and that's that's how our sin problem gets fixed that's how your sin problem can get fixed today you put your faith and trust in the finished work of jesus christ it's the only way to fix our sin problem in ephesians 2 8 through 9 i I love this is in the amplified version And I love how this reads. It says, For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor, drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment, there's that payment, and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort or not through my own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for this salvation. See, we can't claim any credit for our sin problem being fixed. David, King David, was helpless. When he was confronted with his sin, he was helpless, and he knew it. We are helpless. And what I mean by helpless is is there's nothing that we can do to fix the sin issue. The only way that we get forgiveness is because of God's mercy. Mercy because he didn't give us what we deserve. We deserve that punishment that Jesus took for us. And because of his grace. Grace because he gave us what we didn't deserve. We weren't perfect. We we weren't, we, we didn't live our lives the way that we're supposed to live them. But he gave us new life. He gives us forgiveness anyway. And we praise God for that salvation we praise God for that gift Titus 3 5 says he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit 
David, David, threw, David did the only thing that he knew to do is he threw himself at the mercy of God. And we have to do the same thing. We're forgiven because God chooses to forgive us. But I, 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 and and that's, a, that's an amazing, wonderful gift to, to know that we don't have to pay for our sins, that we can be forgiven, that we're not stuck. We don't have to be stuck in our sin issue. But I do want to say this. I want to point this out. Eternal forgiveness... Eternal forgiveness doesn't take away earthly consequences. The eternal forgiveness that God gives us doesn't take away earthly consequences. You, if you continue to read in, in, in 2 Samuel, you, you know that David and, and Bathsheba lost that baby. And it was, a, it was a direct result of the sin that they had committed. And we have to live with the consequences of our sin. God's forgiveness is complete But we still have to face the reality of the harm and the hurt that our sin may have caused to others and and what it's done to our own lives. And sometimes I I think the reason why God allows the consequences is to remind us how big of a deal our sin really is. And and, and the only thing that sin does, and this this is truth, the only thing that sin does is it pulls us away from God and it destroys us. You know why I know that? Because the Bible says that the enemy comes to, to, seeks to kill, steal, and what? And destroy us. And that's what sin, sin does. But thank, thanks be to God that sin is a fixable, fixable issue. And so we receive that forgiveness because forgiveness, what it starts with is it starts with confession. Forgiveness starts with confession. David says that he was conscious of his sin. David was fully aware of his condition before God. He confesses. He says, I know, and with the emphasis on I. He says, I, I know. He knows himself intimately, and he saw how rebellious that he had been. And and, and notice that David didn't play the blame game. You know, well, well, what was she doing out on the roof anyway? Why was she there? Or, Or why didn't Uriah just go home? Why didn't he do what, what, what every husband should do and just go back home? No, he, he knows it was him. He knows it was all him. And he calls it what it is. He didn't say, I, I, I made a mistake. He didn't say, oopsie. He didn't say, like, oh, uh, that wasn't very good. No, he, he said he had rebelled against God. He knew what he was doing. He knew it was wrong, and he... And, even though he knew all those things, he did it anyway. David says, I blew it. I, I blew it in a big way. And you know, when Nathan comes to confront David, uh, that, that passage I, I read to you, it, it's not like Nathan was telling David something that he didn't already know. Um, I, I think what happened to David and what happens to us is, is we just get used to our sin. Or, or worse yet, we kind of get just comfortable in our sin. And we become numb to it. And David had kind of learned to live with that sin. And Nathan confronted him and said, Brother, that ain't good. You're that man. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, I love this, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But do you see the order of things there? Confession first. If we confess our sins... In other words, that means it's on you and it's on me. We have to confess. David, David was loved by God. David was a follower of God. David was, he was appointed king by God. His, but his sin didn't change his positional relationship with God, but it definitely was driving a wedge in his intimacy with God. You've, you've heard me say this before, is that, you, that God is under no obligation to bless disobedience. He's under no obligation to bless disobedience. And some people may say, well, if God paid for my sin on the cross, then why do I have to confess it? We confess it, one, because God told us to, but we confess it because it's rebellion against God, and it reminds us of how much our confession to God reminds us how much we need God. We need his guidance. Confession says that I can't do it life on my own. I need your love. Uh, and I know, God, that left to myself, the only thing that I'm going to do is live for myself. That's all I'm going to do. I need your love. I need your direction. I need your wisdom. I need your forgiveness. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen says, people who conceal their sins 
in other words, hide them, don't ever confess them, will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. You, ma- you know, just bring this into to our modern day context. Imagine a marriage where the spouse does something hurtful, but never ever seeks forgiveness. What, ha- what eventually happens in that relationship? It becomes cold, it becomes distant, it ceases to be what it was. Confession, confession says, I know what I did, I own what I did. I know that what I did was wrong. I know that what I did hurt you. I know that what I did has driven a wedge between us. And, and, and I love you. And, and, and that what I did did nothing to make this relationship stronger. It, it, I, I, don't want, I don't want to put distance between us. Forgiveness comes when, when we confess, when, when we own our mistakes. And that may be a step that you need to take today that there is some unconfessed sin, maybe some sin that you got used to or sin that you're just comfortable with and, and you're confronted today and you say, you know what? I need to confess that. And the next thing there is, I think forgiveness, it, it, it creates this, this restoration. Um, what I mean is, is forgiveness brings, it brings with it uh, restoration, being restored. In verse 10, David calls out to God to create in him a, a, a clean heart, to create in him a, a new heart. And it's interesting the word that David uses. The, the word create there is, it's the same word that was used in Genesis, in Genesis 1 where it's talking about God creating the heavens and the earth. And in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word there is bara, B-A-R-A with an emphasis on the A, bara. And it, it's, it's a word that, that describes something that only God can do. It's, 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 it's a creation. Like you and I can create things, but we make things from things. But bara means creating something out of nothing. It, it's, it's uniquely God. And that's the word that, that, that David uses. God he, he says, the only way I can be made whole again, the only way that I can be forgiven is, God, if you do it. David, in essence, is saying, I, I've lost it all, and I need you, God, to come and create it in me all over again. And you know why David did what he did, why, why he sinned? Um, you know why, why we do what we do, why we, we sin? Because it's, it's what's in us. We can't say, well, because he did that, then that made me sin. Well, she was out on the rooftop, so that made, no. It's, it's what's in us. We, we, those of us who are believers, we're, we're, we're still believers in Christ, but we still live in, in, in the flesh. We, we still live in, this, in these bodies. And, and, and so there's this constant battle going on within us. The flesh is, is kind of how the Bible describes um, us living for ourselves, our, our selfishness. There's the spirit and the flesh. The spirit is the things of God. The flesh is kind of the things of us, things we want to live for ourselves. And, and guess what selfishness wants? What do you think selfishness wants? It wants the self to be number one. So when I'm selfish, I want me to be number one. And the self doesn't want to take a back seat to anybody. Selfishness, you, you don't want to sit in the back seat. You want to be driving. And that includes God when you're living selfishly, you don't want God driving. You want to be driving. The flesh wants what it wants. Uh, in Romans, Paul talks about this. This isn't on the screens. But, if, but he admits that the battle between the flesh and spirit in his own life. This is, this is Paul the apostle. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. And for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, warring uh, waging war against the law of my mind and making me prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. You see, each battle with temptation is won or lost based on how fully surrendered we are to God. We have to surrender daily because until we reach heaven, until we're, we're with God, we are living in a world that's competing for our attention and will do anything and everything to distract us, to distract us from living the life that God has called you and I to live. But here's the good news. God gives us the ability to win that battle every day. You've heard that, maybe you've heard this in church before. We aren't slaves to sin. In other words, we, we have a choice. And that's what David understood. He asked God, he said, God, create in me, restore me. He didn't say, God, I've got this. I can handle this. Oop, my bad. I'll fix it. No. He said, hey, you have to do it. Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not 
for everyone who wants to be saved, they can do it themselves. Or for everyone who wants to be saved, just try harder. No, it says for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved, rescued, renewed, restored. Those are, those are good words. And some of us need that. We need to be saved. We need to be rescued, renewed, restored. That, that, that actually sounds really awesome. And then I love that word, everyone. I, it, it's, it's not an exclusive word. It's very inclusive. Everyone, anyone, all of us, everybody. We call on him and he will forgive us and he will restore us. 2 Timothy 2, 21 so, says, so if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And, and I wanted you to see something from that Timothy passage. Despite our sin, listen to this, despite our sin, God still wants to use us. Your sin does not disqualify you from the work of God. Because if sin disqualified us, then none of us could do anything. Our sin doesn't disqualify. What disqualifies us from being used by God is if we choose not to confess our sin, if we choose not to repent, if we choose to ignore God. God won't choose to use you if you choose not to be used by Him. God won't choose to use you if you choose not to be used by Him. Through God's renewal, restoration, His forgiveness, His new life that He gives us, we are His instruments. We're set apart. We're useful to the Master. And I think there's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines of life in, in, in the game that God wants us to run and He wants us to play because they think they can no longer be used by God because of their past or because of what's happening now. And you need to hear this. As bad as David's sin was, and we, we know how bad it was, God still used King David to do great things. Matter of fact, a lot of what King David did, all of King David did, is in Scripture. And some of the Scripture he wrote. Matter of fact, the New Testament, in the New Testament, David is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Da yeah, David, that David. God still wants to use you. And God will still use you. And that's true of you. Not just the person sitting next to you. It's true of you. Next thing there, restoration. What that, then that leads to, to our repentance. In verses 16 and 17, David says that he knows what God wants. He knows that, that God doesn't want a bunch of religious activity. God is not impressed by religious activity. David said, you don't want the sacrifices or the offerings because if you did, I would have given it to you. David said, God wants more than religion, but he, what he wants is he wants a relationship. God wants, God wants our affections. He wants our hearts. He wants our minds turned toward him. That's, that's, that's actually what it means to repent. You hear that word. It means to turn from or, or, or to, change, to change our minds. We stop living one way, basically living life our way, and we start living God's way. And that happens through humility, through the keen awareness that we're restored only through the love and forgiveness of God. There's no, there's no religious activity that we could ever do to undo our sin. What God wants for us is, is to, for us to understand what he did for us, why he did what he did for us, and how he wants us to live. What he did was he died on the cross for our sins. Why he did it was so that we could be in relationship with him, restored uh, so we can spend eternity with him, and how he wants us to live is completely surrendered to him. It's hard, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard to, to have a puffed up chest, that, you know, to be, to be arrogant uh, when you realize that without God, we're, we're all doomed. It's, it, it's hard to walk around and say, hey, hey, look at me, look at me, look how awesome I am when you understand that you are who you are because God has chosen to forgive you, that he wants to restore you, he wants to make you new. Acts 17.30 says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. God is calling all of us, everyone, to change their minds, to turn and follow him. We know better. We can't claim ignorance. We're forgiven, we're redeemed, we're saved, we're made new, we're restored because of God and only God. And to think any other way, that somehow that you had anything to do with your salvation, it's foolish. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, regret, whereas worldly grief produces 
death. And Paul is saying that godly grief, a grief that comes from the realization that we've, that we've messed up, that, leads, that godly grief leads to change. That leads us to salvation. It's called godly grief because it comes from God. It, it, it's, it's what we feel when, when we realize our sin or we're confronted with our sin. It's exactly what David felt when, when Nathan confronted him. You see, earthly, you notice that they contrast between godly grief and earthly grief in that, in that verse. Earthly grief is grief caused when you get caught. And then you're, you're worried about the consequences that you're going to face because you're caught. But godly grief is a grief that comes from the fact that you, you realize that you rebelled against a good, a holy, an awesome, a mighty, and a loving God. And that gr- grief produces repentance. You, you say, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that again. That wasn't right. I don't want to think that way anymore. I know that that was wrong, and I know that that hurts my relationship with God. I don't want to live like that's okay. I repent because I know that I have been restored. So God has restored me, and so because of that, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn from the way I'm used to living, the way I normally want to live, and I want to live for God. And here's what I know. If we took sin more seriously, I think we would take God more seriously. Sin is just a word that's real easy to say. Sin in our life is, is unfortunately real easy to do. And sin in our life is real easy to just kind of smooth over and to keep living how you want to live. But I think if we took sin more seriously, we would take God more seriously. Sin just isn't, it's not just a mistake. It's, 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 a, it's a fist in the face of God. When we minimize our sin, we, we, we kind of make a mockery of the cross of Christ. Now, I, I'm not, please don't think I'm here, you know, preaching a message of turn or burn. You know, you're going to H-E double hockey stick right now. That's, that's, that's not what I'm saying, but I... I so as a, as, a, as a fellow sinner, as a, from one forgiven sinner uh, trying to tell other people, I, I'm here to tell you that we need to confess our sins. We need to ask for God's forgiveness and we need to let him restore us. And here's the good news. When we ask, he listens, he responds, and he restores. We don't have to be defined by our sin. Instead, let's just be defined by the God who gave us life, the God who loves us, the God who forgives us, the God who gave us grace, the God who gives us mercy, and the God who gave us victory over that sin.